Welcome to Shaping the Future. In this episode, I'm speaking with scientist and author, Professor Sarah Bridle, about her recently published book, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air. Sarah's book provides an invaluable perspective on the reality versus perception of the impact on climate change that our diet actually has. Sarah not only gives examples of how misleading ideals about food buying, preparation and consumption can be, she also explains how the UK government, and I suspect many others, could implement policies that would please local food producers whilst bolstering public support and reducing climate emissions all at the same time. We are what we eat and our diets must be as sustainable as every other component of modern life. Sarah's book is based on hard science but really does belong in the kitchen with all of our other reference books. It's available from all major retailers and the e-book is actually a subsidised free download so there's no excuse for not digesting this important work. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please do subscribe on any of the major channels. We have plenty more interviews on the way and all of them have something positive to say around the discussion of how we shape a better future. Sarah, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure. I just want to start with why food? Because we talk a lot about energy and climate change and with food, we think about being organic or perhaps vegan. But can you identify the key linkages between food and what we call this sort of climate crisis? Sure. At the present time, about a quarter of all climate change is due to food. So that includes clearing land for agriculture, growing crops and putting fertiliser on the fields, and then, you know, animals and burping and and manure and so on, and all the transport packaging, um, all the way up to to when we buy the food. So about a quarter, so that's three quarters is not to do with food. But on the other hand, if we then were to stop burning fossil fuels, which hopefully we will, and with a rising population eating more food and more greenhouse gas emissions intensive food often, then actually, if we stop burning fossil fuels, food will be the biggest cause of climate change. And so over the next decade, hopefully, if we reduce the fossil fuels, then food will then become the big issue of climate change. So we need to start changing our diets over a time period coming up very much now. Okay, and food production in the form of global agriculture is very sensitive to climate changes itself and impacts on food production can easily trigger conflicts and so on. Is this something you researched at all in producing this book? Absolutely you've got both the food contributing to climate change but then as Tim Gore at Oxfam said you know with the way most people will experience climate change is through the availability of food and so this is as you say a, a really huge issue. I had originally hoped to have the book equally balanced between those two topics of food causing climate change and vice versa but actually the amount of information we've got on exactly how climate change is going to affect food is really quite you know it's quite speculative so I do have a chapter in there uh, about it but actually there are forecasts about how different crops are affected by temperature so we have data going back in time you know about how the yields have been and how if we can figure out how temperature affected that we can make a prediction but actually my um conclusion from that is that actually it's the extreme weather events which are the biggest issue And so one of the things which is happening is that if you go back to biblical times, then people were worrying about droughts. They kept grain, you know, from one year to the next to mitigate against the risk of extreme weather. But nowadays we don't do that. So why is that? Well, actually, we assume that when there's a bad harvest in one place, then another place will have plenty of food and and have a good crop. So we kind of mitigate that risk by globalisation. But actually what's happening now is that there's good physics reasons for it to do with the warming of the North Pole but you tend to get weather patterns actually being coherent across say the whole of the northern hemisphere so that actually what we did see a couple of years ago was we had extreme um, hot weather uh, covering say North America and Northern Europe which then you know can knock out multiple bread baskets as they're called at once so we can't necessarily assume that we're going to be able to deal with crop failures by the effect of globalization looking ahead which is okay. which I think the most worrying thing, and that's incredibly hard to predict, those kind of extreme weather events. Because that's all is on the World Economic Forum sort of global risk report. Okay, well, we'll come back to the book, because the list of contents, for a start, it reads like an all-day diner's menu with toast, eggs, cereal, sandwiches, pizza, fish and chips, chicken curry, beer and wine. The wine's my favourite. Can you, <laughs> can you give an example of something that 
really surprised you in researching food and beverage types? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, as you say, I wanted to kind of be able to sort of decide what to eat, really, as the bottom line. And uh, I felt I needed to look at, at all these different options. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of things which I had worried about before that maybe I then learned that I didn't have to worry about quite as much. Um, that there were sort of some fairly easily identifiable big things. So the evening meal tended to be where a lot of the emissions started to stack up. And that's to do with to do with the quantities, but also to do with the amounts of, of meat and dairy, which I guess is not a huge surprise to a lot of people. I think the studies that have been done and my experience of talking to people is that although people often you know, do know roughly that, say, steak is, you know, is the worst of most commonly consumed foods in terms of climate change. Often people don't have a very good sense of how different different foods are. So one example there would be if you had, say, an eight ounce steak and chips for dinner versus a microwaved potato and beans, then there's more than a factor of 20 difference in the climate change impacts. And that's even including all the cooking of those things. So the, the scale was surprised me and the research papers that have been done on people's perceptions also find that that's a, a general thing that people have. So I think the scale of the differences was big. Oven use, that surprised me because when I, I originally started learning about this topic, I went vegan because I was so shocked and that's, that's the information I could find easily but I had my oven on for two hours with my jacket potato in there feeling very smug and maybe I drove to the corner shop to buy some you know green beans or something to go with it nice and healthy but of course you know driving the car that to, to the corner shop that would have been comparable to the oven being on and then air freighting those beans and that comes comparable to an animal product already so there's a few surprises in there as well I found. This is something you, you do talk about in the looking ahead section about veganism. And one of the questions I wanted to ask is, do you see veganism as part of the solution, as a sort of destination we're all moving towards, especially in developed countries? I think my push would be very much on being aware of the climate impacts of different foods as a, as a starting point. I, I wouldn't, well, I don't, I'm not trying to push a particular solution. And I think that at a moment, a lot of the conversations were kind of blundering about in the dark because people don't necessarily know the, the impacts of, of the, the farming that they're doing. And also, you know, there's not an awareness of how much support we need to give to have a food system change, food system transformation, which is what we really need for a lot of different reasons. So I think that for most people, animal products are in the UK, you're looking at the dietary surveys and the research that we're doing, for example, for most people, animal products are causing, you know, a large fraction of their greenhouse gas emissions, so around about a half. And so in terms of the, you know, emissions per portion, as it were, those are the things that most people will benefit from reducing. But actually, if you have one of the plots in the book is um, like a cup of coffee with milk, and you might think, oh, I cut out milk from my cups of tea every morning. And that was a huge thing for me because that was one of my sort of, you know, moments of sanity was sitting there with my cup of tea, my white cup, cup of white tea. But actually you look at the amount of milk that goes into some things, it's very small. And so actually, you know, the milk in a typical cup of tea is comparable emissions uh, climate impact is boiling the water and the tea bag itself is nothing because it's come by ship and, and it's very light and it's not a big deal so some of those things are quite surprising to a lot of people and certainly for me that sort of quantities are actually a lot more important than you know, cutting something out completely for example okay yeah because you've actually just above that that whole point on veganism in climate motivated diet you've got a title which is food emissions for the whole day and it seemed like that was actually a more important thing to grasp from a person's overall lifestyle does that sound fair yeah, definitely I, th I think you know it's going to depend on each person's going to have a different kind of thing that's driving their main sources of climate change emissions but i think that even just halving the quantity of something like if you're having a spaghetti bolognese you know even and just halving the quantity of beef in there would come close to halving the impact of your whole meal because it is the biggest item in that but actually also another thing is that for a lot of people that's quite a sort of depressing thought of reducing something and so actually what the, the research says that it's actually more successful to talk about substituting or increasing a thing so if you think about it as adding more vegetables to your spaghetti bolognese like more tomatoes more onion uh, maybe a few you know bits of carrot or whatever celery and things that give it a lot of flavor and really healthy then automatically you're going to eat less meat per portion and maybe you can put some in the freezer for another day as well so I think some of it is about psychology actually. It does feel like the book is giving us a level of information that we haven't really had we kind of want and a lot of it's psychologically driven we want to eat a climate 
you know, friendly meal, that we want to be more healthy, etc. And yet there are these sort of cultural things. You were just saying about the milk and the tea and, and our smugness when we feel that we've crossed a boundary to do something that's more healthy, but which might actually not be that much more healthy towards the climate. You think it's yes, identifying the big things, yeah. So, so I think that very much as David Mackay would have said, you know, in his in his book about about looking at the big things and not just exhausting ourselves with all these small things. Yeah, I mean about the cup of tea and the my, my editor always says if your granny's made you a, a beautiful cake with eggs in it or whatever and butter, you know, are you going to refuse that piece of cake, which is going to be a you know big family trauma potentially? But if it's you know happening once a year and if you're motivated by climate change, then there's not really a good justification for refusing that cake if it's ethical veganism obviously it's different but in terms of climate change you know we are already contributing to climate change by eating and it's just small changes depending on if we're adding in a little bit of something extra it's not necessarily a big difference so I think there's there's lots of things that we can do which make a much bigger difference than those small things. This book is such a fascinating instruction manual or utility to, to how we think about our food. Have you had any trouble differentiating that for an audience in terms of saying actually I know it's a science book but it's actually not it's actually more useful to everyone yeah I, I, I think when I originally wrote the first few chapters and sent them to my editor I was um, imagining that it was going to go in the science section of the, the bookshops but then he came back you know and they thought about it I said well actually it should go in the food section and that was really exciting to me because that is a section that I go to you know when I go into a bookshop and I really do want it to reach people that are not scientists and so what I really appreciated actually was following the format of, of David Mackay's book actually of having the main text uh, which I hope is readable to people who have not necessarily thought about this at all and not scientists but then having end notes at the end of each chapter which I'm really happy go all the way back to the original scientific literature but all those details are hidden away in those end notes so hopefully the scientists can be happy because they can go and read all those details if they want to but the main text I hope is sort of uncluttered and easy to read if you're not an expert and a couple of colleagues of mine uh, suggested putting key points at the end of each chapter which was agony to sort of pick out just the, the, the main sort of bullet points but a lot of people have come back and said they really appreciated being able to skim those sometimes and then read the whole chapter if they you know they're really interested in that topic even yeah okay well, food's been in the news a lot recently with reference to quality standards in the uk in the face of trade deals can you talk about the role of governments and policy makers and how they could make changes that tick the climate and public health box at the same time. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much in the Agriculture Bill, it's, it's hard to sort of address some of those issues I mean, one go. I mean, one of the things which was passed in the House of Lords was to add in interim emissions targets, specifically on agriculture for 2030. I mean, that's really an essential thing that policymakers can do to be a lot more aware of accounting. You know, we need to know what we're doing in order to be on a path and to map out that trajectory. So that's really important and I think in order to get there what we really need is a lot more information as you say a lot of this information is not easy to get hold of and my dream is that there would be labels on all food packets or at least available at the point of sale you know maybe it's a web page with a barcode or whatever to give the greenhouse gas emissions the climate impacts of each individual food item and a lot of people kind of get concerned there that I'm suggesting we put the burden on the consumer to do everything but actually what's been seen in the past is for example the sugar labeling so we have the traffic lights on, on like packets in this country right where if you're in the red category then that's a you know high amount of sugar and maybe people will avoid those products and then actually what happened was that they changed the threshold from red to amber on those traffic lights for the quantity of sugar and they made it known a few months in advance and in fact all of the companies that were on track to be shifting from amber to red they all reformed formulated to reduce the amount of sugar in their products so that when that actually came in when that change happened there was no products that moved from the amber category to the red category so the bottom line is that something that maybe probably a lot of consumers certainly I wasn't aware of at the time actually the country is healthier as a result of mm -hmm. some labeling that's on front of packets so labeling isn't all about the consumer it's actually about producers having an incentive and a knowledge that what they're doing at all stages of supply chain, including on the farm, is actually, you know, being appreciated by the consumer. Potentially the information's there. There's a lot of great stuff happening already um, that people are doing, which isn't really appreciated right now. And ultimately, if that 
type of intervention isn't enough, then we may have to move towards it, financial incentives. And there are people who say we should be taxing meat to help with climate change. But I feel that it would be fairer if we could do this taxation based on actual climate impacts. Um, that have been gathered and and are mandatory in a a specific way every time. And so we can't move to that. For example, we couldn't have had a sugar tax if there wasn't the sugar labelling in the first place. And in order to bring in those kind of taxes, we absolutely have to have consumer buy-in. We've seen the kind of controversy about the sugar tax and this kind of potential nanny state issue. Well, we absolutely need consumers to be asking for this kind of information and these kind of interventions to happen. Even if we're not putting the burden on individual consumers to change their diets, we do need consumers to demand this change from governments. Okay, and that brings us back to why a book of this kind is so necessary just to educate people because we, we are all interested in what we eat. It drives a lot of what we're doing every day, certainly for me. Anyway. It's a, that relationship between consuming and producing that we kind of need to shore up both sides, see the benefits, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Originally, I I was trying to figure out what I could do that would contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from food. And I originally started doing some data science, you know, image analysis of crops and so on to try to help improve yields. But the more I learned, the more I learned that we're going to have to change our diets and, and that technology alone isn't enough. And so I started getting more into that area. And I was talking to people, you know, at different places like food producers and government. And, you know, how can we work together to make this change? And what I learned from that was that basically when the consumer says we want something done everyone else has to answer to it so you look at what happened with plastics for example you know companies are falling over themselves to make commitments about plastic reduction the government's able to bring in things like the plastic bag tax and more interventions so so the consumers i believe have a huge amount of power and it's not all about changing our individually changing our diets but actually you know we can we can really do something here okay well that's a really good place to finish i think thank you very much and yeah i really hope that Everybody has this book to hand in their kitchen. <laughs> well, I just mentioned that the ebook is free. Um, so this is, you know, wanted the information to get out everywhere. So. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's been fantastic to talk.